so first of all, thank you for agreeing to doing this. I mean, it, it, oh, I feel pleasure. like when you get to your level, you know, it's hard. You, you probably get requests every day and you've got to pick and choose. Ah. So I don't know why you, you agreed to this, but God bless you for doing that. Oh, thank you so much for the compliments. And yeah, I love, I love your whole philosophy. I'm excited to be here. Good, good. Well, we, uh, you know, as a recap, uh, we're, we're Retire Sooner podcast, and it mm -hmm. came from a book I did called You Could Retire Sooner Than You Think. It really, that was a outcropping of a research project, always trying to figure out the habits of the unhappy group mm -hmm. versus the happy group. And then always just stud studying those habits and it just keeps expanding over the years. And I've been doing research project after research project for a decade plus and, um, and then that grew into what the happiest retirees know and this podcast. And um, so that is, that is maybe the, what's a little different about this is that we really have a lot of research based. Uh, I love it. Stati we have a lot of statistics that we go on and then we can kind of make our determinations, but we want to at least start with the statistics. Um, Yay. But, but when it comes to, I would say the other enormous theme that we're so passionate about here, Martha, is the, the idea of, if we're following all the, this happy retiree recipe, what are the other pieces of the equation mm. that also lead to a happy retirement way beyond the money side? And, right. And we're always looking for people and experts that really have a real, real major grasp on anything around purpose, <laughs> anything around, um, you know, we call them core pursuits or hobbies on steroids. And all of this oh, comes down to... You know, you have this, I would say, kind of the first and, and a very refreshing take on um, integrity. But the way you describe integrity is so much, I think it's like, it, it is right in the fairway of what the happy retiree needs. So let, why don't we start out with, um, and again, you know, you're, I think you're the first book, The Way of Integrity. It was like the first book, non-fiction book to be on Oprah's list. I mean, she's out like, I don't know. It's like, she, I know you're not paying Oprah, but you might as well be paying Oprah because she's like your biggest <laughs> champion. Oh, she's been really, really lovely to me over the years. And uh, I owe her a lot. What can I say? So maybe so. just, maybe we'll start with, you know, describing the audience uh, to describe to our listeners about your version of what integrity is. Describe sure. it in your words. Yeah, it has the sound of a sort of Sunday school word uh, that you hear from the church lady. I hate that. Um, I mean integrity as in structural integrity. So if an airplane is in structural integrity, all of its parts are working smoothly and together. And that means it is one thing. And that's what integrity actually means. It's from the root word from, for integer. It means intact and whole. And the airplane can fly if all the pieces are working together. If it can't, if it's not, if the, stru the structure gets, um, you know, aligned incorrectly or something's missing or whatever, the plane can't take off or it can't be steered or it even crashes. And that's how our lives work too. We have multiple parts inside us and around us. If we can get all those to work as one, then we're in integrity and then life is really, you can really fly. So it's almost this this thought of harmony of 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 yes. all the different components. What are what are kind of the bigger components of being in harmony? Well, the first thing is that there's a distinction, a big bifurcation, a cutting in two that happens when we're little, because we're all born with what I think is the genetic imprint of our destiny. And it's not about what will happen to us, but the things we're interested in, the things that will make us happy throughout life. I think a lot of it's genetically determined. And that's fine if you're tiny, but you're being socialized by people who need you to probably be quieter than you want to be or less active or more cheerful or tougher, if, especially if they identify you as a boy. And um, as you grow up, even before you can talk, you're so finely attuned to social cues that you'll start to feel the places where the culture, and that means just the people around you, are pushing back against your nature, which is what you were born to be. And virtually every human infant, when this happens, will sell out their true nature hard and go with the culture <laughs> because we really needed grown-ups to survive, right? And right there, we've split ourselves into that's not integrity, it's duplicity. 
Mm. And as we grow, we may fragment more and more depending on socialization, difficult experiences. And so we end up in multiplicity. And then we get to a point where we don't really know who we are anymore. And we feel like we've lost the track of our destiny because we have, we're off trying to please people. It's funny. I, one of our guests here, Raj uh, Raghunathan, who's a social scientist and a, uh, talks about, he grew up in India for the first, I think 20, mm-hmm. you know, for 25 years. And he just said like, there was two choices. It's like, you are either an engineer or a doctor. And there's no, yep. nothing else, period. Can you imagine yep. growing up in a culture and here in the United States, like we at least have like a third choice. Like you can, you know, <laughs> right. at least we, they, we give our kids like three things. You can be a doctor, lawyer, and maybe something creative, writer or whatever. But maybe. imagine like the, the world we live in, the culturally, here's, here's a question. When I, it's so funny the way you, uh, I, you can totally see that's like, we're as kids, we're relying on adults and we're like, okay, mm-hmm. we, we kind of have to conform to the adults. So we're going to go with that path. And then we get mm-hmm. split. If you were to chart it, and this is not to be, you, know, you don't have to give me an exact answer here, but how are, do we just, do we get divided a little bit internally early on? It just gets worse forever. And then we have more obligations and then we have to stick with it. Or does it, mm-hmm. does this phenomenon show up later in life? Or what do you think the, the path is of this split, if you will? It shows up really early for almost everyone. Some people are more like I have one child who is really just made of integrity and could not be broken. And and so that child was quite defiant of attempts to socialize. And then I have a child with Down syndrome who can't comply with a lot of the cultural thing. And when he was born, I kind of went, hmm, what if I just see who my children are instead of trying to make them into what I want. And a lot of my thinking came from watching them grow up. So I really believe that this split happens very early for almost everyone. But it and the the symptom it creates to alert us to the fact that we're split is any kind of emotional suffering. It could be anger, it could be depression, it could be anxiety, whatever. So when that happens with a child, usually it's kind of under the radar. They're trying; they're so compliant, or they're busy. You just put them into things, and they don't really show up with problems because, and they're not allowed to have problems like that. And then they get to be teenagers, and the ones that are most split are the ones that are called the crazy teenagers because they're trying to. Sometimes they try to medicate their pain. Sometimes they try to find any kind of approval from their peers because they don't know who they are. And then they get to be adults. Those of us who managed to hold on to pleasing other people until later in life, like for me, it was when I was about 29 that it just finally broke. Mm. And it's actually, we get further from our true selves the longer we can keep up the ruse that we're just what the culture wants. Wow. So you even said, I think one of the ways you, you, you position this is that the more in harmony we are, then the the more likely we're almost in that weird like we're weird weirdo camp is that which is that oh, yeah. did i hear that right is that is that yeah because cultures the whole idea is to fit people together into a sort of amalgamation and the way the human social brain is constructed it it pushes toward conformity and that's why anything that is perceived as outgroup or other is seen as dangerous by our brains because we're basically monkeys in socks, right? right. <laughs> so that, so there's a part of us that is, it's a very in-group thing. And if we find our individuality within that intense uh, a psychology of sameness, we are at some point or another going to break out of that culture's norms. And the moment we do that, people are going to be like one of the people I think I describe in the book, he quit smoking. And his whole social life exploded because it was completely based around this sort of feeling of um, us against them that the smokers had. You know, it was in Minnesota. They'd go outside in the winter and it was like 60 below zero and 12 people are out there smoking away. And they're like, yeah, stick it to the man, you know. (laughs) So when he quit smoking, his friendship group died. Because smoking and being us against them was the culture of that friendship group. group. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so whatever you do, you can do the most innocent, the most virtuous thing in the world, and it could put people off. You know, when I think about how that, well, first, I guess I wanted to ask you 
about your story um, because mm. you, you kind of when you 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 you've you've talked about this some, um, but you almost you said you you were like a you were really living the ruse, I guess you're saying oh, yeah. in, your, in your parlance. Oh, it's yeah. like, Oh, I just, I eventually, and then it broke. Like the longer you go, oh, yeah. the more dramatic it is. Just give us a little, the, you're, it's fascinating, but tell me, tell our listeners about your so, story. Yeah. I was in deep out of my integrity. I guess that's a paradox, but um, I grew up in a very Mormon, the Mormonist town in the world. And I was going to be a good Mormon girl, except I wanted to go away to college and I got into Harvard. So then I go off at 17 and you can't find two more different cultures within the United States than the city where I grew up, where everyone's Mormon and Harvard. And I was trying to fit into both. So what happened is I just thought, I don't know what's true. Anything. I was in this sort of subjective, well, everything's screened through the lens of our perce- uh, perceptions. Excuse me. So nothing is ultimately true. So I'm just going to adapt. So in Mormonism, everybody thought I was this good Mormon girl. And at Harvard, everybody thought I was a very rational atheist. And I just kept <laughs> sailing along. I had no idea what I really was. And it wasn't until I... I was on my third Harvard degree that, that I got pregnant with my son. He was diagnosed with Down syndrome and I had to make a decision midway through the pregnancy. And it made me for the very first time ever, I stepped back and thought, what do I think? Mm-hmm. Because kids, will, kids the, will do that to us, won't they? <laughs> yeah. Cause you'll do things for your kid that you won't do for yourself. So the doctors were saying he's a malignant tumor. Literally they used that phrase. Let us take him out. And, and I'm pro-choice, but the fact is I already had bonded with him. Mm. And it was not, it was like my, exi- I had another child. It was as if that child had been hit by a car and they said, just shoot her. <laughs> you know? mm. I was like, no, he's already my baby. Um, but what is, he- so it's what kind of baby do I want to have? And then I started thinking, what kind of human life is worth creating? And what kind of life is worth creating for myself? And I didn't know. So I took this huge step back and I made the decision that felt right to me, um, which was way outside the Harvard culture, fit right into the Mormon culture. But then I moved back to Utah. It turned out I was a lesbian. <laughs> so that, that, play, that plays so well in Mormon America, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I know. I always say I went to Harvard to choose to have a child with an intellectual disability. And then I moved back to Provo, Utah to become a lesbian. And people ask me for advice. <laughs> <laughs> what, well, okay, so w- what was harder? Uh, well, when you moved back to Provo, mm. uh, what was that when you finally found your integrity there? What, yeah. what was the process you had to go through? And then how tough was it for you? And what was the what was the fallout? Because I feel like as you're listening to Martha Beck, you're thinking, okay, I know, I know I, there's something else I should be doing. But you're, we're, we're, of course, thinking of the practicality of the world and mm. the fallout of making these decisions. Like, what was oh, yeah. your fallout? Because it seems like that'd be a pretty extreme case. Oh, yes. So I, first <laughs> I want to preface this by saying I have worked with thousands of clients. I have never had one where it went as badly as it went for me. So yeah. don't think that if you decide to live your truth, you're going to go through this. But what I did, I went back to Provo and I was on this quest for truth because I didn't know what it was. So I was trying all these, I was reading philosophy. I was reading religious from all kinds of religions. I was living the Mormon code, but I also lived pretty much any code I could find. And one of the things that all the wisdom traditions tell you is the truth will set you free. Mm-hmm. So I thought, okay, the, the year I was t- 29, on New Year's Eve, I made a resolution not to tell a single lie for the entire calendar year. And I kept that resolution. When you do that, like not even a white, not even a, not even a, no white lies, no sugar nope. coating, even no, not even Nothing. some sugar coating. No, uh-uh. okay, straight... if somebody said, do I look fat in this? I would say, you look amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say, look, I'd take them to the mirror and say, how do you feel about this? You have to find new ways of communicating when you're not mm. lying. Mm. You have to find ways of being kind <laughs> without lying. It can be done. It just takes that a lot baby. Of- oh, that baby, <laughs> he looks so smart. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. <laughs> such a smart looking baby. 
Um, okay. So, yeah. so you, so that was your first step and you, and you really, and that you just made that, that wasn't, you didn't read that somewhere. You thought, okay, maybe I'll try just being totally honest for yeah. a year. Yeah. And what did the, what came of that? So kind of a, okay. I feel like we all think we're mostly always telling the truth, but you're right. There's always sugar coating. There's always, yeah all of this. So what happened? Did you do that forever? Yeah. Are you still doing it? <laughs> I'm still doing it now. I've gone on and off it. Um, there was at the end of that year, I decided if I were in Nazi Germany and I was hiding Jews and the Gestapo came, I would lie to them and feel fine about it. So just mm. lying verbally, there are situations where I think that's moral. Anyway, um, what happened to me was it was kind of like an archaeology of self. I wasn't telling any big lies. They were mostly lies to sugarcoat things. But as I stopped telling them, my own deeper truth started to come up. And I started having very um, horrific flashbacks of being abused as a child by my Mormon hero father and like ended up in therapy and everything. And during that year, this is what I either walked away from or lost um, my religion. That went right out the window. My family of origin sort of went with that. Um, my marriage, because I realized I was gay. Um, let's see what else my home. Oh, I quit my job. Wasn't right for me. Uh, quit my entire industry because academia was fun for me as a student, but not as much as a researcher and professor. Um, so my home, yeah, pretty much everything except my children and my teeth went <laughs> on the bonfire. I did. What did most so wait, of my did your teeth. family though? What happened there? Did if you're not Mormon within the culture, do they? Almost, I mean, do they don't want you to be part of them anymore? It it depends. There are definitely are Mormon families who just will turn away, particularly if you if you're gay or trans or whatever. But in my case, the the final straw was that I was, you know, claiming that there had been abuse in my childhood. The family was not up mm. for that, oh. and so that was it. So how brutal was that year? After all, I mean, that to me, it seems like a really, Ooh. really hard year then, or more. Took than me that. down to the floorboards. I am telling you, it knocked out every attachment. Now I say in the meditation language, it it was horrendous, and I really urge you not to, to do it. But I wouldn't take it back for all the tea in China. And the weird thing was by that time, I mean, you have to understand, Wes, I, I was so out of integrity. There are a few things that happen to sh when you're out of integrity and they're progressive. So first you feel bad emotionally, bad moods, then your body starts to get sick. People who just agree not to tell as many lies for three weeks compared to control groups, they have fewer doctor visits, fewer sore throats and head colds, fewer accidents, better relationships. And this is just saying to a bunch of researchers, I won't lie as much as usual for three weeks. Lying rips your body apart. So I was chronically ill, practically dying from autoimmune diseases by the time I took my oath. And yeah, my, I think it would have killed me to, to continue the way I was doing um, in such a severe multiplicity. So, yeah, it, that's what pushed me to do it. And unless you are that desperate, go more easily on yourselves out there. <laughs> but but ultimately, within about how, how long was your kind of rediscovery then until you started to feel that harmony and feel the integrity where things were getting back into, or not back into line because they maybe never were, but getting mm. into that harmony? How long did it, did it feel like it took a year or two? No, immediate, boom immediate. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think our, our listeners will think, okay, that's a pretty extreme case, right? When your family's involved and you end up having a schism Very with the family, that's a big deal, right? Huge. Um, so, so let's, let's say we take that one step less extreme where it is, um, you know, our, my culture says I should do this. I uh, practically, and this maybe goes back to how you help people find this this integrity. Yeah. And I know you have you in your book, there's lists of the kind of worksheets to help you do this, but let's just talk about maybe on a more practical level where we live. I think about the statistic that I mentioned a fair amount is that in America, Gartner group does a study that shows that, you know, only one in five people are really fully engaged in their job. They love work. And then mm. three out of five are take it or leave it. And then one out of five 
uh, is hates their job so much that they actually right. like to bring their company down, right? They want their, wow. their company to do poorly. So so eight, wow. four out of five, 80% of Americans either take it or leave it or hate my job. Mm. I mean, it's a lot of people, Martha. So where wow. is the practical uh, intersection here of like, well, I kind of got to do, I got to work. Like I got like, what about the, 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 the disconnect between finding into, or the, let's say the intersection of finding integrity and then allowing your life to, to match up to that, because that feels like yeah. a little, that's a little scary. Yes, it is. And I'm going to answer with two different things. The first thing, as you said, there are these exercises that you can do to help you feel what integrity is like. So I want to do a very brief one and then explain how that works practically. So I have been all over the world. I've coached people at very homeless people in, in Africa, uh, billionaires in America, all kinds of different folks. And I always ask them what one statement puts more, it feels most true to them. So there's a sort of sense of truth within us. And I found that the, the most powerful sentence I can get people to say and in terms of feeling that it is true within the body, heart, mind, soul is the phrase, I am meant to live in peace. So if everybody out there listening, if you, Wes, want to join in, like just take 10 seconds or so and repeat in your mind, while breathing in a relaxed way, notice what happens in your body, in your heart. When you repeat the phrase, I am meant to live in peace. So I am meant to live in peace. Yeah. So just say it to yourself a few times. And this is then, Martha, this is something that you found universally, mm-hmm. universally got people to a state of, of closer to this harmony you're talking right. about. How does it feel to you? it feels peaceful. <laughs> it really yep. does. It, yeah. I mean, I think there is something when you're c- kind of combined, the, the thought around the word peace or peaceful in itself is really calming. And, right. um, I'm just thinking this through, I kind of, was, I'm shutting my eyes thinking about Good. it. Is it, um, it's just a very calming, uh, war. It's like a, a feeling of kind of warmth of like, Oh, I feel like I'm in a right. good, it's a good place to be a good place to feel, Martha, if we can get there, and that's the, my question, how do, how do we maybe, so, so that's one, so one, stop lying to start to think about that question to yourself of, of, I want to, I want to, I, I yeah. meant to live in peace, peace. And then I'm going to get to the pragmatic part. So what you just experienced there as a warm, relaxed feeling was not just the, that the words have a good association, but it aligns with your sense of reality. So that's the feeling right there where, you, where you're thinking that, and that's the only thing in your mind. You've come into alignment. And so you're in integrity at the moment you're repeating that thought and believing it. And that's why I said it's immediate. The second you come out of duplicity or out of self-abandonment and, and start to believe what's true for you, immediately the relaxation begins. My physical symptoms started healing the second I started doing this. So practically, what happened was my whole life blew up. But I started to gravitate toward whatever brought me into a deep sense of peace, that sense of truth. I was obsessed with the truth. And for me, that was like the thing that makes me feel that way all through my body. So my physical symptoms started to heal. Then I started to be able to see that I had specific interests and desires. I hadn't known that before. I just did what people told me to. I would walk through a bookstore and certain books would pull me toward them and others were like, no, thank you. And so in a very short time, I started getting ideas for ways that I could survive, make money, thrive by doing the things that really appealed to me. And those things had tremendous traction and fascination for me. And let me tell you something. I was teaching business school, which ironically, I love. Um, But what I realized is that love sells better than hate. If you hate what you're doing, and you hate the people you're doing it with and the place you're doing, then you are producing something bathed in hate and asking people to spend money for it. If you're doing something you love with people you love in a place you love, you're trying to sell something based in love and people 
sense it. There was no profession called life coach when I was doing this. My students just started asking me to please talk to them separately and they'd pay me money. And I was like, what? I've never heard of such a thing. You know, I'm not a therapist, right? Um, but I was teaching career development and I kept saying things to them like, you should love your job. And they would be like, wait, what? Go back. <laughs> These brilliant kids. So my profession grew out of my passion for talking to those people. And it's given me a very good life. Thank you very much. So I think about, and I want to ask you about what integrity looks like in getting into retirement. But I also, mm. but I also wonder, I guess it's never too late. First of all, never, right? I mean, never, 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 too never. But I want to, and here, here's a story. This is the, this is how ingrained we get. And I, and the, here's a story of, um, this is a, a, a family I've worked with for, for a long time, ready to retire a little bit early, having cold mm -hmm. feet to do it. Yeah. And even though they're there financially, they're still, they're still pretty young. So when I, if you're in your late fifties, it still feels in America. Oh like yeah. That's pretty early. Right. Yeah. Um, and what, and sometimes you can't really cure that if you, even if you have, we, cause we don't know what the next five years are. What if we're in the worst recession of all time for five years or right. three years or two? Yeah. So there's always this uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, and, and I, there's this concept I call the retirement gray zone, which is if you've kind of saved enough and you don't need to max out your income anymore and you're not fully ready to go cold Turkey, full earning to zero and just start mm. living on your assets, then go into this gray zone, which really requires uh, some sort of part-time work. And, yeah. and, the, and the, the problem that she was having was like, well, I've, I, I'm full time. Like I, I don't, my employer would never let me go mm. part time. And, um, you know, my, I don't know if my profession lends itself to being part time. It's kind of all in or all out. Mm. And, I, and I said, you know, here you are at almost 60, you've got this hat of I'm a baby boomer and this is just the way we do it. Mm. I said, look around and look at the 25 year olds that you work with to yeah. 35. Like they're fine to say, look, I'm only coming in two days a week and that's what I'm doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we live in a totally new world where you think this is the way that you think yeah. this is the way it is, but, but put out your millennial or your Gen Z hat on for just a couple months and explore. Yeah. Is there a way for you to just go two days a week? Wow. Yeah. I never thought of it that way. Two days a week. Well, I guess I could, but it, it's like for her, it's out of her alignment of like, well, I, I'm supposed to work five days a week and she was you know, somebody right. the private equity brought their company. So she her six weeks of vacation went down to two. And I said, this is no longer, you don't need to do it. But she yeah. was, it was so hard for her to, f to fathom having a flexible yeah. work schedule. Let's do flexible. So anyway, so, so I'm talking about the, pra what do you tell me practically? How do we get there? Okay. So the first thing you just pointed that out perfectly is if you can't fathom something, you're not going to do it. Like, and every one of those women's beliefs came from her socialization. They're not even true anymore. Like the pandemic showed us nobody really needs to go into the office that much, right? We can do just fine with all this amazing technology that didn't even exist when I was born. So the mental set that is, studies show that most people don't make any drastic changes in their lives over the age of 23 because that's how long it takes to sort of get the ropes of adult life in our culture. But the culture is changing so fast around us that, as you said, millennials and gen whatever, they have a very <laughs> fluid idea of what communication, um, information transfer, which is most of our economy, what that works like and what that looks like. And they also, interestingly enough, there's research showing that kids who grew up playing video games, which are supposed to rot the mind, right? They're used to the, the scenario of dying and getting another life, dying and getting another life. So they're more willing to go into, let's try this experimental thing to make money. Okay, that didn't work. I'll die. I'll get another life. My generation that you're talking about doesn't have that mindset. Right. So the it first doesn't. thing is you got to change your mind. And the second your mind changes, avenues appear for doing work in a different way because everything is changing so fast. There are ways, yes, jobs are disappearing, but 
other things. Like I just hired uh, for my company, I can't even remember the word, a community manager, okay? To manage my online community, which I never meant to create. It just agglomerated. And then they were like, we are your community. I'm like, why, why? <laughs> and I had to get a manager to manage the fact that I have a community. I'm paying that person a good chunk of change. I didn't know that profession existed, but there are all kinds of things popping up that are ways of making money. Martha, you would go back to that. Go back to the thought around age 23. You said we, we, we were fully mm. baked by what? By age 23? What was that? That's pretty old research, but I think you'd probably find that by 25, people are like, okay, I think I know how to live. And then if a massive change comes after that, well, I mean, the pandemic showed us all that when we have to change, we can't, even if we're old. But usually people feel like they've got the ropes when they're pretty good at life. You know, the 80-20 principle, they can do 80% of things. And it's change is threatening to the brain and to the psyche, to the emotional self. So they just, a lot of people just dig in and say, I'm never going to change again. And they don't. And life sort of whizzes past them because they might not be changing, but the world is. I want to ask you about a couple of words that you that you write about. Uh, one yeah. of the they're, and they're they're somewhat I think they're related, but I want to hear your take on this. And the, and the, the first word is longing, and the, mm, and, yeah. and the second word is yearning. And maybe they're just cousins. Maybe it's the same thing. Yeah, but, they're family you know, you, members. You write about. Every, every human has a, a, a handful of things that we yearn, is it yearn for? What are mm -hmm. they? What, tell me about yearning yeah. and longing. Um, I love the word longing because it's part of the word belonging. And those are the, the two things that we have is our individual needs we yearn for and then the longing to be part of a larger group. So they go right together. They're just slightly different for me. But think of it this way. I usually define this by first having people list a few things they want and they might want you know a really good retirement package and you know a nice house and a good place you know, a boat whatever um then i ask okay put that list aside and now tell me when you wake up at night three in the morning pitch dark quiet can't go back to sleep what do you yearn for and it's different because what you want is shaped by the culture, but what you yearn for is is your own. It's the first thing you get to keep. You may not know what your destiny is, but if no other traces are left, there will be yearning. And it will take the shape of your destiny if you decide to serve it, if you decide to move forward based on that. It's mm. like a compass. So what comes up for you when I say that? Ooh. Man, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I'm the one doing the interview here, Martha. Um, <laughs> I know, but I can't stop coaching. It's what I love. You know, um, so I'm a parent like you. I've got four. I've got four kids, and um, you know, part of that, I would say, one of the initial things you yearn, I yearn for, is something to do with them, right? It's, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if it's like a. I'm closing my eyes. I'm just thinking here. It's like a it's almost like the time with them or connection with them or seeing them do well or do or be, be in a good place. Like a, you know, and, and, and as a, as a working you know dad, like most Americans, you know, you're off, off doing so many other things. Maybe I always have this underlying, like I'm just not doing, I'm not enough. I'm not with them enough. Right. Yeah. And I, yeah. and I, maybe that's one of the things to maybe always feels a little, the tanks never as full yeah. as I want it to be. And I, I feel like that's almost a yearning. To some, yeah, it is. A, it's maybe a yearning for connection, mm -hmm. for connection. It's the longing for belonging. Um, and it's, it's actually, so this is the, that you come to a choice point when you know what you yearn for. That's your truth. You can't fake that. Um, and so then you're faced with, okay, I'm yearning for more connectedness with my family. What, can, what steps can I take in the real world to get that? And the real test of faith is, will I do it even if I'm afraid it might hurt my income? Because our whole culture is, is 
has the King Midas syndrome. Like mm. I need everything I touch to turn to gold. And then you end up in a room full of gold with nobody else. And it's sad. So you're, I love what your podcast does because it's basically encouraging and supporting people in taking that bet that if you do what you long for, if you do what you yearn for, the means of support will be there. But you can't find out that that's true until you actually risk it a little bit at least. What what do you think what, what are kind of the the pillars of what of human yearning? What do we what do we all yearn um, for? One was one of them I guess is connection. You just said this, yes, right? Yes, it's love, um peace, freedom and joy. And that is about the end of the list. It is such a short list and look at it. None of those things are objects. They're all feeling states. Yeah. And we think that the, the things that will take us to those yearning states are the things the culture tells us are valuable. So money, status, power, whatever. And then it, it, it turns out that our culture is wrong. Well, it's based on a truth and a lie, right? The truth is that if you're in the forest, cold and hungry, and someone brings you in and gives you hot soup and a blanket, you'll, be, you'll feel better. The lie is that if someone gives you 10 rooms with and puts 10 times as many blankets on you and forces you to eat 10 bowls of soup, you'll be 10 times happier. So <laughs> it's such a good analogy. Yeah. It, it just doesn't work like that. And so if you've got the room and the soup and the blanket daring to say, now I'm going to try to look into other things and that bring me peace, joy, love, belonging, even though they don't bring me more blankets and more soup, it's against the culture. But the culture's not making us happy. Right. So you give us, we have this King Midas culture. Yeah. King mm -hmm. Midas culture. Um, but I do love, I know, I know I've heard you I, I, I talk about the, the bowls of soup, or I, I can see using, um, I, I love that as a financial analogy, by the way. How many bowls of soup do you really need? Right. I love that. Yeah. yeah. I really love that. And there's that. never enough. It's like Vladimir Putin, there's never enough power to make him feel enough. Right. There's right. a, a story about Kurt Vonnegut and Joseph Heller at this party with a bunch of millionaires. And uh, Kurt Vonnegut said to Joseph Heller, who was the author of Catch-22, um, how does it make you feel to know that these guys make more in a week than you made out of your whole huge acclaimed success? And Joseph said, well, yeah, that's a problem, but I have one thing that they'll never have. And Kurt Vonnegut said, what? And he said, enough. Mm because it's enough when you feel it's enough. Love, peace, freedom, joy is the reality of what we need. But you're right. Yeah. If you were to look it up in culture, it's like money, status, power is anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is, it seems like it still has a better marketing team. Um, oh yeah. Than love, peace, freedom, joy. <laughs> and the reason it does is because as all marketers know, it really helps to hit the pain points and get people a little scared. So our whole culture operates on fear and triggers all the things in the brain that lead to fear and a feeling of scarcity. Which is money-based. Yeah. And yeah. it's also on the left hemisphere of the brain. On the right side, if you can break out of culture and start connecting, all the things in the brain that are about connection, about imagination, about creativity, they're all on the right hemisphere. So you can't do them when you're scared. So the culture keeps us scared. And that means it's such a deep evolutionary primal instinct that as long as we're scared, we're going to focus on fear, scarcity, and getting, you know, accumulating enough, but it's never enough. It's only enough when we relax and go into the other part of the brain, which sees infinite creative opportunities for making a living in the world. And a lot that you know, you'll, you'll come up with thousands that nobody else has ever thought of, but not if you remain in fear. Yeah. And, and it's part of, um, I, I used to write about this. I haven't for a long time, but the, maybe one of the earlier premises to you can retire sooner than you think was that the culture around the financial industry is by default, similar to what you just said. It's a bunch of big public traded companies. Think about it. They're, they're earning, earnings have to grow every week or every, every quarter. Yeah. Why would you ever tell anybody you have enough money, right? It's always, it's not quite enough. Never keep enough. saving. It's not quite enough. Keep saving. So, and you can't really, I don't blame them. That is, that's, that's what the business that they're in, but they're yeah. so powerful 
And I, I was joking about marketing, but they're so good at marketing that that yeah. permeates as this, as this um, to our entire society. Uh, yes. You, you mentioned um, the, a lasting cure to unhappiness. Uh, is this, mm-hmm. is the lasting cure to simply just get in alignment? Get it, get yeah, in integrity? Yeah, it is. But there are, there are different stages of it. So <laughs> at the risk of putting everyone off, my, my sort of armature for, for the book I just wrote was Dante's Divine Comedy because I think he was writing a metaphor for happiness and how to get there. And the first part is he's running around. He does, it, it, it starts out, in the middle of my life, I awoke in a dark and wild place and I had no idea how I got there and I didn't like it. And it was like I'd slept, walked off my right path and now I couldn't find my way back. Then he sees this mountain and it's all bathed in sunlight. So it's golden and all these people are trying to climb up it. And he thinks, ah, that's the way. So he tries to do that, but he keeps getting chased down the mountain by animals that he defines as emotion states. There's a leopard who's ravenous and never satisfied. There's a wolf who's really depressing and a lion who's really scary. Ultimately, to get out of that place, he has to go through hell. And that means he has to figure out every place that he's not being true to himself. And he goes down through the famous inferno. And I believe that represents all the parts of ourselves that are attached to thoughts that make us suffer. And he has to question every single one of them. And then when he keeps going down and down and down and down, after he's freed himself from all his illusions, he goes through the center of the earth and suddenly what was down becomes up. And so he's clear inside himself, but then he has to climb a mountain because he has to take what he's done inside and he has to act according to his own integrity in the outside world. And that's when you get pushed back and it's scary in a whole new way. But if you can sustain it, the higher you get, the more joyful you become, the more. And by the way, that whole climb, he's with people who are happy, who are love each other. The belonging comes right after you stop lying to yourself because you're with people who are also not lying. And then all the way, you know, he climbs all the way up the mountain. And when he's completely aligned, he suddenly starts rising into paradise. And my experience is that if you, if you start to live your truth, stuff starts to happen that is flat out miraculous. But you do have to go through and to some extent, and you lived that your own inferno was oh yeah that year of essentially having starting over career, family, everything. And so, so, you know, so we, that, we, that wasn't it. It was letting go. Uh, that was the inferno. It was breaking uh, the bonds. The climbing part was the next part. Okay. So what do I love? How do I want to parent? How do I want to partner in the world? How, what work do I want to do? That was the climbing and it was joyful. Just the way you went into peace for a moment when you just said the words, the moment I started finding my own truth instead of the culture's truth around me, even though everything was chaos and loss around me, inside myself, I started to feel so much peace, health, joy, love, all the stuff we just talked about immediately. I wanted to ask you about your, the physical, so again, we, we go into retirement, we're obviously, all, we're all getting older, uh, and when every day as we head into retirement, that's that's always a concern. So there's money is, is kind of number one. I think number mm-hmm. two is this always worry about health care because we're worried about our being able to pay yeah. to maintain our health. And, we're, and we, we, we enter uh, retirement, maybe a little overworked, a little beaten down, a little less healthy than we'd want to be. And it's, mm. it's actually well documented that retirement can be really unhealthy right? Too hmm. much TV, yeah, lack of those. socialization. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't have to get up necessarily. So we just get out of schedule, got to sink. Um, you, you, when you went through this year of you know, no lying, you, you found your truth. You physically were in a much better place. Just, I'm just interested to hear about, oh my you God. said you had autoimmune and then the autoimmune kind of went away or got better. How did, what happened? That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. I mean, um, I I was out jogging. I got clipped by a car one day in the hip and the doctors said, just lie down till it feels better. And 12 years later, it still didn't feel better. It, it, in fact, the pain spread through my whole body and they couldn't really diagnose what it was. So they said, you have fibromyalgia. Then it started affecting my internal organs and they did surgery and they're like, oh, you have some serious autoimmune diseases. We may have to start removing your organs. There are really no cures for this. I started. this is in your twenties. When was this? 
Yeah, this was no in my mid twenties. Yeah. Well, you did casually get hit by a car, by the way. I love how you say that. Yeah, I get clipped by a car. I just got <laughs> clipped. I mean, it it knocked me into a snowbank, and then I got up and ran eleven miles home. So okay, that was so not you yeah. ideal. But it's something happened. Um, okay. Something did happen, but that's often with some people who have chronic conditions. It often starts with an original acute form. Anyway, they I had all these things, lesions on my skin, like organs decaying and stuff. And they were all autoimmune, poorly understood, and incurable and progressive. Oh, yay. So I'm in my Something early 20s. Something you love to hear in your 20s. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it just got worse and worse. And it was, I mean, every day, every second of every day, I was in physical pain. It was excruciating. Couldn't move my hands. Could, well, yeah, it was bad. And um, when I started getting really clear, and that I wasn't going to buckle to the social pressure and go back to betraying myself. It just, they all went away. Well, so you were, just li- you were, you, you were really living in conflict and the conflict was oh physically God, yes. harming you. Yeah. Absolutely. I wonder how many and people in America, one. how many people out there are, are living in that same conflict and how, how many people are being essentially beaten down every day from the yeah. inside out. There's a ton of research showing that lying and keeping secrets is one of the most destructive things you can do to your body. That's why lie detectors work. Because the moment you say something that isn't true, the moment you say something that isn't true, your brain works differently, your fight or flight response comes online, and that's going to bathe you in cortisol and adrenaline and things that create all kinds of diseases. Uh, Your muscle strength goes down, your heart rate goes up. It's it's catastrophic to the body to lie. And every time you get up and go do something where you don't want to get up and go do it, every time you pretend it's okay when inside, deep inside it's not, it's kind of a lie that you're telling with your life. And it's not because you're bad. It's because you're trying so very hard to be good. Yeah. The best people are the ones who suffer the most, right? So, yeah, to say I am going to stop lying may offend the people around you, but inside yourself, your body will suddenly say, oh, thank God, and everything starts to go better. The only reason I was able to be a writer, because I couldn't use my hands, was that I started telling the truth, and the pain went away. So the signs that we might see, if you've got some telltale, is it just physical? What are are the signs for, for people? The first one is a sense of having no purpose. You'd okay, think it would and I'm be, asking so, signs of being out of alignment, I guess is what I'm asking you. So yeah, one, so the first one, and, and you'd think it would be the physical pain and stuff. It's not. People suffer more mm-hmm. from a, a loss of purpose than any other loss. Like Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning, he managed to live through Auschwitz because he had a purpose. And people come to me and they say, I don't know my purpose. If you're retiring and all you've done is punch the company clock, and you never rediscovered your purpose, you'll just sit at home watching TV and die. <laughs> because purpose true. is like the silver thread of, of life that keeps us moving forward. Then you're going to start to feel bad emotionally, depression, anxiety, hostility. Then you're going to start to develop physical symptoms, ex- exhaustion, uh, brain fog, fatigue, inability to, um, to feel comfortable in your, in your chair at work. You know, I got to the point where I was teaching, the, I love teaching business school, but being a sociology professor wasn't my jam. And I would drive up to campus and I would be too weak to open the car door. <laughs> Man, you were, out of, you were totally out of alignment. I know. And in the meantime, I was working on a, a memoir that became my first bestseller, you know, tapping it out with one finger because I couldn't move my hand. And I noticed that the days I stayed home from campus and worked on that, I had much less pain and much less depression. When I went to campus, I was like a a rag doll and totally depressed. So I told my dean, I'm quitting. And he said, well, we really need more women. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I have to quit. I said, this place, it's really not good. Like I would have to go on severe antidepressants to keep working here. And the dean said, well, I'm on antidepressants. (laughs) (laughs) He goes, join the club. Of course, we all have to be on those things to be here. (laughs) You got to have your job. Do whatever it takes. No, no, you got to have your purpose. Do whatever it takes. 
what about so there's a you 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 have a so this is a popular sex tip that yes. that works into <laughs> other areas of life and since i have yes. at least two pages on romance love connection sex in the book you can retire what the happy retirees know uh, I, and I never ask anybody about this, but I'll ask you because you, you, what are those that, that translate to life? <laughs> the, the, okay. So I think what you're talking about is something um, um, one of my coaches that I trained came up with. And she said, it's advice to men in particular in the bedroom. If what you're doing isn't working, don't do it harder. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is only do. for guys, okay? By the all the girls just lost it in the studio. Everyone's laughing, right? So, <laughs> so yeah. So what happens is we we were in our like I was at Harvard. I got my undergraduate degree. I'm like, oh, that didn't make me happy. I must need another one. So I went back for my master's. Still not happy. I clearly need another Harvard degree, PhD. <laughs> it never worked. I just kept doing it harder. <laughs> yeah. And it just, it did made it worse and worse. It made it worse yes, and worse. Yes, it did. Yeah. Yes, indeed it did. And it always will. The, um, so, so as we, as we wrap here today, the, um, maybe some parting wisdom for, for our listeners on steps we can start to take to, to connect with peace and get yeah. to a place where we have more, I love the structural integrity, our structural yeah. human integrity. Uh, is it is it a workbook questionnaire? Is it what what? How do we get started today? It has to be simple and it has to be memorable. It can't be as complex as an exercise because what we're working with is a very primitive part of the brain that can only do small, like leaps of imagination. So the first thing I want everyone out there to remember is slow is fast. I tried doing everything. What does fast. that mean? What does that mean? It means that people who uh, research change find that taking small steps um, persistently is really the only way anyone ever makes a, a successful life transformation. So in my book, I call them one degree turns. If you're in that airplane and you're flying 10,000 miles and every half hour you turn one degree north, you won't even notice the plane turning, but you'll end up in a completely different place, right? So as you change, like when you said to yourself, I'm meant to live in peace and felt the sensation in your body and emotions, that's a one degree turn. It's tiny. And then maybe you make a list of things to do today and you look at them and you think, which one, which one of these brings me the most peace and which one of these brings me the least peace or pushes me away from peace? Maybe do 10 minutes less of the thing that is disrupting your peace and use those 10 minutes to do things that build your peace or, or help you align with your peace. Every few weeks, make another 10 minute shift and you will find your life going in a very different direction. Slow is fast. You know, it's the, the, the thought of flying across the Atlantic ocean and just slowly turning one degree. You're right. It's like the difference between, Northern Africa and Scandinavia. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, how long did, did this, this is like a life, this newer, this newer book, the way of integrity, how long, I, I know these are life's there's kind of like, these are life works, but yeah. it is how long did you, were you working, working on the way of integrity? Uh, I did a couple of, I, I the, the no lie pledge that I made, I started doing those, often and I called them integrity cleanses because I was cleansing away everything that wasn't in my integrity. Um, and I, I offered a course online and it was really popular. So I'd made it bigger and it was really popular. So I thought, I think this is a book. By the time I got the whole thing written, it was probably five or six years. Um, and I've been on an integrity cleanse the whole time. The, where do we, for people to find you beyond buying books, um, mm -hmm. where else do we find Martha back besides CBS and today's show and the retire sooner podcast? <laughs> Thank you. Well, there's my website, Martha Beck.com. My favorite new thing that I'm doing that is like, brings me such delight is a podcast I do with my partner, Rowan Mangan, and it's called bewildered. 
And it also, it's, you can pronounce it be wildered because when you move away from the culture, you become more wild. So it's, uh, oh, that's cool. people are, yeah, confused by the culture and helping them find their nature, which is wilder. And are you finding folks that have had a dramatic life change or people that are helping people see the light to be able to do a life change? What are some of your guests? What we do is we just, we don't do guests very much. What we do is we take questions and then we address different topics. So like yesterday we we recorded one on parenting, the way the culture pressures you to show up as a parent, as opposed to the way you would show up if you were just completely focused on your parenting instincts and your love for your children. Um, like your, your cultural mind says fathers go out and work and make money. They, they aren't supposed to stay with their yeah. kids all day. Yeah. That's to be a wilder parent. You would say, yeah, not me. And you would play with your kids until you felt really satisfied. And then you'd do something else. So we always take a topic and then like examine it in light of the research on it and um, the way we've experienced it as well. Is there a cultural confinement to what we're supposed to be doing in retirement? Have you ever run yeah. across that or what, oh, what yeah. like, what are we saying? So, yeah. I'm- well, there's a famous case. I can't remember her name, but there was a woman who watched her mother um, die at 60. And so when she was 60, she just sold everything and moved into a retirement home waiting to die. And she lived to be like 95. So there's 35 years of waiting to die. And I just remember that story. That was something that was going around when I was a young sociologist. And I thought, okay, that's not going to happen to me. So that now I'm at the age when a lot of people do retire. And um, what I've noticed is there's this stereotype. You can, TV commercials will always show you the cultural stereotype. Mm. So you're young and romantic, except you've got gray hair. And you're laughing together as you hold hands in adjacent bathtubs on a vista for some reason and it's like you have to be there's that the phenomenon online of women laughing while eating salad alone there's this things that never happen in real life so you're supposed to be like frolicking uh, instead of doing the things that people do in say china which is a culture that venerates age where you become not just older but elder and in traditional societies not being the olders but being the elders, you become a fount of wisdom. You become, you make yourself available as the kind of encyclopedia of the younger people because you've lived a lot and you've seen a lot. And there's profound importance in that. And so being with other people and being the source of thoughtfulness and wisdom and morals and ethics and kindness and love, that should go more and more and more um, into our hearts as we get older and older and older. We get, so think of it as just getting wiser and wiser and wiser and sharing that. And guess what? People may end up paying you. <laughs> I, I love the thought of instead of being older, be elder. That's yeah. cool. We're going to end it there. Yeah. Uh, this is so, we we're so lucky to, to find folks like you and we're th- so thankful for you, for you to come on to the, to the show, to the, to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so grateful.